the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab episode 689 for Tuesday, December 26th, 2017. <laughs> And welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where you send in your tips, questions, and cool stuff found, with the goal being that each and every one of us learns, yes, four new things. It's still 2017, this being the last episode that we'll record in 2017, but we're not yet sure where things are going to go for 2018. Will the number go up from four? Will it go down? Will it remain the same? You'll have to tune in next week to find out. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, celebrating Boxing Day, this is John F. Braun. It is Boxing Day. I think it's also the beginning of Kwanzaa. I think it's also St. Stephen's Day somewhere. And I think it's Proclamation Day also. So I, I, I'm pretty sure of those four things, which, of course, I learned from my day-by-day uh, -day Dilbert calendar. That I keep on my oh. desk down in my office. I think proclamation. That was the one I couldn't remember, uh, uh, but I'm pretty sure that's it. Yeah. Cause I was thinking yeah. about something witty where I could say, I proclaim that it's the St. Stephen proclaims that it's boxing day on Kwanzaa or something like, there you go there. That's it. Yeah. That's the, witty. couldn't quite pull it off, but Hey, um, <laughs> the more holidays, I, thought the I did right? pull it off. <laughs> the more holidays, the better. Right. Time, uh, time yes. to reflect, spend time with friends and family. Things like that. There you go. Yeah. Uh, speaking of friends and family, our friend Larry has uh, has a question for us to address. Larry writes in and he says, it seems that every day I get the same authentication window saying com.apple.webkit.plugins.64 wants to use your confidential information stored in your keychain to allow this Enter the login keychain password, and then you get the window that I think most Mac users have seen uh, or will see, where it says always allow, deny, or allow. And uh, Larry says he keeps clicking always allow so that it won't pester him again. And yet, every day it pesters him again. Uh, he says, like a good boy, I provide, I provide the required information. The window goes away without complaint, only to arise the following day. Um, I skipped one thing while I was reading the error message because I, I wanted to kind of focus back on this. It asks for the confidential information stored in v4.services.acrobat.com inside his keychain. And I've seen this type of thing before. The specifics of where it is looking matter only for the for your uh, scenario, but they do matter. What I have found to solve this is to go into the keychain and look for that v4.services.acrobat.com or whatever it's looking at and, and telling you about. Oftentimes, these keychain entries can get, I don't want to say corrupted, but they can get their settings not in alignment uh, with <laughs> the way the universe needs them. And, and when I say the I universe, corrupted. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, but I mean, the data's there. So it's like the metadata is corrupted almost, right? The the, the shell. The bit got flipped. Yeah. Seri and I'm, I'm, I'm totally serious. No, and I think you're happens, right. Yeah. It can happen and it will happen. It will. Yeah. So what I've found that can solve this is to go into keychain access, which you launch. It's inside your applications utilities folder, or you can do what I do to launch every single app on my Mac is I hit command spacebar and I start typing uh, the, the name of the app, and then I just launch it from Spotlight. But uh, go in there and look for this, in this case, you know, the v4.services.acrobat.com and delete it. Hopefully, it, if you, well, if you don't know the password that's stored in there, then it, I highly recommend you take a look at that password before you go about deleting it. And then the next day when it comes up, it's going to ask you differently. It's going to say, I need the password for this thing. You type it in and uh, hopefully that will resolve it. That's the, that's the plan in those environments and those scenarios. And it generally works. 
Any other thoughts on that, John, before we... Uh... Oh, yeah. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. No, um, <laughs> so one thought was just a general UI thought. Um, you, you said that you suspected that um, the always allow key was pressed, but the thing is, what, what disturbs me about this dialogue, and I think uh, that they haven't updated keychain access in a while, is that typically the default choice should have something around it, like a darker border or you know the thing in bold or something there, but there is you, no default choice for this dialogue when it comes yeah, up uh, so what i'm saying is you know is that something that's wrong or is that just how keychain access deals with it so well uh, remember this isn't keychain access that's put, putting this up this is just the operating system right that's saying i need this uh, and can you authenticate me? And and I've I've thought about this before because you're, you're right. It there is no default choice. There's nothing that's highlighted. I actually think that's a good thing because mm -hmm. they're not leading you in any one direction, right? It, it, you know, it's you've got to read this. You have to make your decision. The problem with a default option is that if you just hit enter, it is chosen. And you might choose it without being very aware of what you just chose to do. Yes, exactly. So, that that's kind of what I was saying. Yeah. It's what happens if you just hit return? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah. Um, the other thing, it, um, and this, uh, now I don't really use Adobe Cloudy type services, but it sounds like this is having a problem with it, and I wonder if it could be due to an extension or a plugin that you're that this service expects, and maybe reviewing. Whatever Adobe specific, you know, cloud type plugins you have, maybe another uh, thing oh, yeah. in this case. Because it seems to be, well, I mean, it's saying, you know, WebKit. I mean, WebKit is, you know, Safari, Safari probably. Yeah. Um, and Acrobat is certainly uh, Adobe. So, yep. <laughs> so it could be that they're using a, a, a service that has gotten confused about, um, you know, I guess it's storing the credentials locally, but when it tries to get them, it's like, well, something's wrong. Can you please? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't blame you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's that's not another that's not a bad way to go, right? That's that and then and then you get rid of the problem. So yeah. Cool. All right. We're off to the races here. Thanks, Larry. Uh moving on to Chuck here. Chuck says, uh talking about this what's come out uh, I guess in the last week, right? Since we since we last Scandal. spoke. Yeah, well, this thing where Apple uh, where it was discovered and then Apple loosely confirmed that when an iPhone 6, 6S or 7's battery becomes out of spec, they actually slow down the maximum CPU speed of the iPhone so as not to overdraw power from the battery that can't provide power, which then causes reboots. The big problem, of course, is... Apple doesn't tell you when it's going to do this to your phone. And that's a bad thing. Uh, I think the, I think the, the fact yeah. that they're doing it is great that, I mean, it's great in that they're keeping your phone alive and functional while you have the opportunity to go change your battery. The problem is they didn't tell you that you should go change your battery. Yeah. That's bad. Yeah. I don't think there was any malice involved. I think they just didn't, fully document the phenomenon oh which they yeah do my, for a lot of things but in this case they didn't say by the way you know if your battery sucks then we're going to kind of back off because we don't want your phone to die in like you know an hour yeah my <laughs> guess is right this this was introduced in a in 10 to 1 right which was the build released at the end of january last year or, or this year sorry so uh about 11 months old and you know that's like Chief bug fixing time for iOS. My guess is that some engineer or group of engineers came up with this solution and mm -hmm. tested it and it worked. Okay, great. Put it in the, the build, commit it to the repo, check the box, move on to the next bug. I don't, I don't think it ever went up the chain, right? Uh, at Apple. I don't think, you know, Tim Cook was sitting there, you know, tapping his fingers together saying, aha, yes, we can get these people. I get, yeah, I just, I don't think, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think Apple made a huge user experience error with yeah. the way they did this. But I, like you said, I don't think it was malicious. I think it was just, it like no one was ever made aware of it. It was just like, yep, we fixed that bug. All right, great. Move on. Well, Charles asked, he says, I'm not concerned about the conspiracy theorists that would portray this as Apple's way to encourage the purchase of a new iPhone, but 
I do actively manage my iPhone app use and settings to get the best daily battery life for my iPhone 7. An early uh, iteration of this New York Times article that he re refers to, he says, uh, pointed to a battery management app for the iPhone. However, when I checked, there are many. So I'm wondering if you guys have a preferred app that allows tracking and checking recharge cycles and other battery conditions in the same way that, say, fruit juice does for my MacBook Air. So that's a really good question. Uh, really, the two that I use, and I'm hoping you have you can you can save me here, John. The two that I use are actually Mac apps there. And we've talked about them sort of uh, almost in every episode recently. It's coconut battery and I amazing. They're built to look at, uh, you know, from your Mac across USB or across Wi-Fi, perhaps at, uh, at your iPhone's battery. And that's, that's great, but it would be even better if you could do that from the phone. The problem is the data that's exposed to applications running on the phone isn't quite as robust as the data that's exposed to a Mac that's connected via USB. But perhaps you have something, John, that can point us there. I do, but this is fleeting. Okay. And, and if you recall in the past, I had an app that did something similar. Um, yeah, called Battery Status or something, right? But you can't get that anymore. Right, is that... So the thing is, you can search in the in the the app store and search for things like battery charge or battery life or battery status, and you'll get a bunch of things coming up. A lot of them are free. Um, some of them are like ninety nine cents, and some are like in app purchase. Sure. And I find that they're very fleeting. The ones that I've purchased, and actually one time I bought a pro version, you know, I laid down the 99 cents. Sure. Yeah, right, <laughs> right, right. And it worked for a while, but then I found that uh, either an OS update... so. Uh, I agree with you in that the iOS apps, I think, for the most part, are doing something innovative um, in order to come up with these numbers versus uh, uh, what I think is a better documented interface when doing it from the computer, right? Yes. Not necessarily over USB, because as we've seen, iStat uh, uh, Mini has like stuff I didn't even know the phone knew. Um, and it has all of the, the important numbers here. And actually, but I did find one, Dave. So it's called Battery Life. Uh, uh, in the last round of app, when I was trying out apps, I, I found it and I just checked it on my iPhone 7. And it does have, it, it doesn't have charge cycles, but it does have capacity. So current and maximum. And then the, the current charge as part of the uh Current maximum. So mine shows, so it says, okay, you got 1,800 out of 1,960 milliamp hours. So I've lost a bit of capacity, 92%. But hey, that's not bad. And then sure. it says you're charged at this level of 1,800. Um, that's the best I found on short notice. So okay. if you look long and hard, you may be able to find something, but I'm with you in that those two apps, um, I mean, if you don't have a Mac, then... <laughs> Right. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let us know. I mean, uh, I found them, you found them, Dave, but but I think you found, as I do, that they're kind of fleeting and that they, they usually break. While we're here, I want to ask you a question, which I think you're going to give me the mm. same answer to, but that old battery status app that isn't available, at least not currently in the app store, also gave the maximum possible amperage provided by whatever charger was plugged into your iPhone. And I found that yes. really handy. And what I'd really like to do is test that with my iPhone 10 on a Qi charger on the wireless charger pad, but I don't have that app on my iPhone 10 and I can't download it from the app store. So I'm curious, do you know of any app that shows you well, that data? I think ice that menu shows you the, uh, it shows a figure when your phone is charging. I think it may show watts, so you may have to do some math. I don't think it shows the watts. Right, but iStat menu, are you, are you talking about... Oh, I, I know what you're saying. I, I think it also... No, I'm almost about, certain wait, wait, it shows are you saying the I'm capacity amazing? of the charger. Yes, I, iMazing Mini. I'm sorry. Okay. I think if it's charging, it will show the advertised capacity of the charger. I'm, I'm uh, really certain. And it'll show that over Wi-Fi, even if the phone's being charged? Yes. Ah, okay. All right, cool. I got to dig into that then. All right, great. That's good. Good. Yeah, because those numbers, of course, aren't the numbers that are real. <laughs> right. No, but I would like to. <laughs> I know to, what you're saying. It's I'd, like, you I'd know, like, uh, 2.1 amps, uh, 
five volts. And, yeah. Yeah. Cause I can see like when I, I have, I think next to my bed, I'm trying to remember which one I have. I, I have the mono price charger and then some other charger I found on Amazon. They both were about 10 bucks. And the one of them says that it can do more, whatever more is right. And so I think the one that I have by my bed, I can, is the one that's supposed to do more. And so I put my USB meter on it while my phone was, you know, below 50%. So it was going to take a decent amount of juice and, or a decent amount of current, I should say. And then, um, it was showing from the outlet to the charging pad that I was getting, or it was taking 1.5 amps, right? So, okay, great. But I wonder how much of that is making it to the phone. Like what is the charger advertised to the phone as its capacity? Because you're going to lose some in the, you know, in the translation. So anyway, all right. You want to, uh, you want to take us to Andrew, John? Yeah, I was going to run into the next room and get a cable and verify this for you, but we'll do that later. Okay. Because <laughs> no, I'm almost certain I saw it. I was like, hey, that's that's what Dave's looking for um, yeah. in the past. All right, so who are we looking for here? Andrew. Is it not in the there thing? There we go. Okay, okay, Andrew. Well, I think Andrew has a... Uh, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll play, I'll play track Andrew. For him. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. G'day, John, and g'day, Dave. This is Andrew in Bellingen, Australia, again. Uh, before we get underway, first of all, thanks for everything in 2017. I and a zillions of other people around the world absolutely love having uh, you blokes in our homes and our ears and our cars and wherever each week. So uh, thanks very much for that this year. So I have uh, one more thing uh, for this year. I've heard that phrase before. I'm referring to your discussion a few weeks ago about backups and making sure that your backups actually do work after you've created a backup. So <clears throat> that scared the uh, whatever's out of me. So I started checking the backups I had done for both my MacBook and also my iMac, and they all work fine. But one thing I didn't realize, and I would like you to explain why, is I was creating a backup of my uh, MacBook Pro to a 128 gig Toshiba uh, USB stick. And I thought I would be able to boot from this and live happily ever after. It's USB 3. I have a USB A to USB C adapter, but it is just way too slow to run uh, my MacBook. And then I checked out, you know, the speeds that, you know, my USB drive can do or my USB thumb drive can do. And it's only like 100 megabytes transfer, whereas a rotating disk is 500 megabytes. And an SSD, again, is, you know, around about, you know, uh, five gigabytes speed. So what I'm wondering is what do they make, what are USB drives made of that are different to solid state drives? I would have thought they were the same. Obviously not. If you could help explain it to us, that'd be great. Thanks, guys. Have a great end of the year. See you in 2018. Bye for now. Thanks, Andrew. All right, John, you want to take it? This is a big one, but uh, this is going to be system engineering 101 in a sense, because um, as Andrew observed, the drives um, have different pieces here. Um, one is the memory chip. So, so specifically for an SSD, you have the memory chips and you have the interface um, that it plugs into. He mentioned USB 3. Um, the thing is you have many levels. Um, if, if you peel the onion here, is that so, so the first thing is that you may have not one or more interfaces, any one of which could be a bottleneck, um, either by design or just the limitations of the interface. So for example, uh, for the most part, when you're talking to um, a hard drive in a computer, the, the interface is SATA, and that's built to talk to hard drives. And there's SATA 1, SATA 2, SATA 3, and they have different speeds, ranging from 1.5 gigabits per second to 6 gigabits per second. But you could also have um, a USB interface. And as you pointed out, USB 3, that's another interface. Well, wait, 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 wait. I, I got to stop you there because I, I feel like we're go potentially going in the wrong direction here. All right. Um, a USB interface could also have SATA and most likely does have a SATA interface between the USB interface and the, the drive or the chips that are the, the flash memory that is the drive. Right. I mean, it's, it's not just USB to a drive. It's USB to SATA to a drive. 
Right. Well, SATA is more in the case of an SSD. I don't think SATA you're going to have with a with a flash drive with a or a thumb drive. So I'm trying to separate yeah, the two okay. here as far as the the eventual interface. There, there is an interface, but I, I don't believe it's SATA. Correct. In the case of a but thumb it, but drive. It, right. I just didn't want to equate. I didn't want to compare USB to SATA because they are they are not at the same. Like yes. you said, they're not at the same level. They're different layers of the onion. Um, you'd compare USB to FireWire. And, you know, sort of to Thunderbolt, but even that starts to get prickly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So to set the stage, so the thing we're most familiar with are thumb drives, and that's uh, almost always USB. Um, So you have the speed of that interface, which USB 3 can be, uh, I believe, 5 gigabits per second. Um, And then I'll talk about SSDs in a moment. I just want to set the stage by talking about SATA. But um, that's not the case with the thumb drive. The thing is, the thumb drive is going to have an interface, uh, USB 3, 5 gigs per second. But whatever it's talking to um, is what's going to limit the speed. And typically, the thing that it talks to is something that we'll call a controller. It can be SATA, or it could be something else. Um, And then it goes to something called flash memory. And flash memory is the same, whether it's memory in a USB thumb drive or an SSD, and that it's memory that you can read from and write to, and we'll call that flash memory. The thing is, the capabilities of those vary widely in that kind of you get what you pay for. (laughs) Um, And also, you're limited by space. I mean, the space in a thumb drive is obviously way more limited, so you're not going to get the performance, because it's just hard to do uh, in a cost-effective manner. Though, if you have the money, I'm I'm sure you could. I think there are one terabyte thumb drives out there if you wanted to lay down a few thousand dollars or 10,000 bucks. Um, so that's the other aspect. Um, so different pieces of the system are going to, are going to potentially limit the speed. What you really have to do, and this is the thing is never trust the interface speed. I guess what I want to say is that do not trust the speed of the interface. So if it's a USB three drive, it has the potential to go up to a certain speed, but you got to look either in the specs or find benchmarks to find out what the true speed is. And they do have these for thumb drives. And they may, if you dig in the specs, although they say, yes, it's a USB 3 drive. Well, by the way, here's the effective speed that you can read from it right to the drive. Now, some sites, like I think Tom's Hardware is pretty good about this, Dave, or others will benchmark the drives. Um, or the specs will have the true throughput of the drive. So it's the same memory. It's all flash memory, but you have to dig and uh, you know, do your research before you purchase the drive so it doesn't disappoint you. Because yeah, I wouldn't want to boot. <laughs> I wouldn't want to run an operating system on a flash drive. Um, From a thumb drive, day. yeah. Yeah, it, it's curious though. I mean, right, it's it because not all flash memory is created equal, right? You've got the class of flash memory that's in most thumb drives that's relatively slow. And then you've got the class of flash memory that's in say, you know, your SSD and that's usually quite fast, but yeah. like, and you I think said, you're talking tens of mega or what we'd like to call it, or call it order of magnitude. You may be talking tens of megabytes a second on a thumb drive, but hundreds or even more on an SSD. Because right. Of the class of memory. But you know, it, it does beg the question. What, you know, when we say the word thumb drive, words that's two words um don't worry i'll get it right we think of of something very specific but the difference between say a thumb drive and a usb connectable ssd is you know that line is blurred because they're both sort of the same kind of thing it's you know flash memory that you're connecting to your mac via usb one is just a different class of that flash memory and operates much faster than the other. And so, the specifics of what is talking. So in one case it's USB three to something to flash memory. In the other case, it's USB three to SATA something to an SSD. Right. So it's Which similar in the flash memory. Different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying is it, I think if, if we, you know, if we go back and listen to this episode it, you know, at the end of 2018 and certainly at the end of 2019, I think this discussion uh, is certainly relevant today, but I don't think it'll age well. Right. Because I, I think that line will continue to be blurred, especially as all these components get smaller and smaller. I mean, I've got a two terabyte drive that's not much bigger than most of my thumb drives and it screams. Right. So, it, you know, it 
like it, it's all about size until everything's small enough to, to fit. And then, you know, you just sort of shrug your shoulders and say, yeah, I can't tell without plugging it in and testing it. So, yeah. Um, if you want to test your, uh, your, your drives, there's a, um, uh, the black magic speed test oh, app yeah. that I will link to in the show notes. I can't find it here, but, uh, it's great. It really is the, um, it's sort of the, the industry standard in terms of benchmarking drives and it just makes it so easy. So I'll put uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. If it's available in the Mac App Store, it's called the Black Magic Speed Test. I think that's what it's it's Black Magic right. something, right? Yeah, Black Magic Disk Speed Test. It's great. It you just run it and but it I'll, starts doing all kinds of stuff, and you can see reads and writes. It works great. Go ahead. I'll just say if you surf, you can find stuff. So I I, I just the the first thing I found, Dave Lexar, which I actually have some of their thumb drives already. Yep, Lexar Jump Drive USB three uh, throughput four hundred megabytes read uh, one fifty write. That's pretty fast. See what I mean? Yeah. So, um, but the older ones, I mean, yeah, I have some of their older, well, especially USB two, which is a bottleneck in itself. But um, right. No, they look to be out there. No, I see. I see several USB three drives, uh, Lexar, Sandisk, that have things in the hundreds of megabytes per second. Some in the low hundreds. So, yeah. Uh, again, you get what you pay for. While we're on the subject of drives, listener David had this question. He says, I had two external hard drives attached to my Synology NAS and both for some reason failed at the same time. And now neither of them can be formatted, read nothing. They do mount when plugged in and basic info like partitions and storage sizes are visible. When I run basic disk utility, it comes up almost immediately as OK. But when I try to format the disk, it unmounts and fails after the creating partition map message with uh, POSIX reports the operation couldn't be completed. Resource busy operation failed. The drives are 500 gigs and I'm not going to spend the hundred bucks to get the disk fix software because that would be way more than to just replace the drives as new. Any thoughts or just trash them and move on. So, um, it, you know, there are two external hard drives, right? So, Kind of taking the concept that John introduced in the last question, there's many layers here, right? The drive is is at the core of it, of course, although we could peel apart a drive and get to even more layers. But let's treat the drive as, you know, its own entity. So there's the drive, but then there's also the case that comes with an external drive that has probably a SATA bus, like John said, and then also probably a USB bus or, you know, a Firewire bus or even a Thunderbolt bus to get it connected to your computer. It's possible, possible that the drives themselves are fine and something happened to the inner workings of the, uh, the, 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 you know, the guts, the smarts in the case. The fact that both of them died simultaneously is sort of curious, right? Um, I have had drives in the past, especially drives that I got at the same time and ran in such a capacity that they were sort of always running. I've had them fail within days of each other. That's not rare. And when that's happened, it's truly been the drive. But you might have had a power spike or something that, you know, flaked out the circuits inside the cases. So you could extract the drives from these cases, which depending on the case might be really easy or really difficult or anywhere in between, and then try to connect them to your Mac some other way, either a different case or one of those, you know, newer tech drive adapters or one of the Voyager toaster kind of things that uh, OWC sells and, and you can actually get from lots of different people. I would try that because I'm a geek, right? I, I definitely would want to know, is it the drive for certain or is it, you know, is the drive still good? But assuming that I took the drive out of this thing, plugged it into my little Voyager toaster that I have on my desk and mounted that thing and it still went through all of this, once a drive is dead, uh, unless you need data off of it, and I hope you don't, uh, but unless you need data off of it, throw it away and move on. Because it's just, it's like... Even if you could run some software on this drive that somehow magically got it working again, I can only assume 
that, you know, it, that's not going to last. It's just going to get worse. It's this sounds like a hardware problem with the drive. This isn't just, you know, a reformat will always fix what I call software or, uh, you know, directory corruption on a drive. But when there's hardware problems with the drive, of course, a reformat will not. And that's where you are. So I, I think you're going to wind up throwing these, drive, these drives away. But if you have one of those external drive adapters or a toaster or something to put it in, um, you guys know what I mean when I say toaster. Uh, it's worth looking online. It's a little device that sort of looks like a toaster, largely because it has most of them have two drive bays right next to them. And you just drop the drive right in the top. You don't have to like unscrew the case or anything. You just drop it in and it's connected to your Mac with either USB Firewire or Thunderbolt, depending on how you want to do it. And, um, and you can just mount the drive. It's really easy to do. It's, it's great for exactly this kind of scenario. So there you go. What do you think, John? The one additional thing I would like to do. So I agree with you. It could be, uh, a power component in the enclosure. So put the drive into something else and see what happens. I'd be very curious to run a smart utility. Um, oh, the last yeah. one that I ran, whose details that I, I like, and that it, it seems to be smart, uh, Drive DX. I haven't had to run it for a while because I haven't had any drives uh, fail on me, or, or I suspect are failing. But... um. Yep, and look at that. There's a new version, 1.7. I have 1.6. Man, I'm just out of it. So, <laughs> um, But anyways, no, it tells you, uh, it, it gives you additional information about bad things that the drive has reported um, or tried to report or has recorded in its own little world. Yep. And um, yeah, I would do that. Um, though I'm with you, I find it highly unlikely that, well, no, actually, it kind of makes sense that the drives failed at the same time. Yeah. Now, wait, I wonder if the Synology itself did the damage. Ooh, it blew the drives up. Well, it, it could have, right? Because they were both, <laughs> I mean, they were both connected USB. So, yeah, I mean, it's possible. Something across the bus could have blown It blew up. the controllers on the, uh, you know, on the, uh, I, may, I mean, probably not. Yeah. But, yep. But, um, but the bottom line is something that can get additional uh, hardware specific information versus, because clearly something... So yeah, it sounds like something. Drive DX or similar smart utility. I'll tell you what's up. Yeah, there you go. But, um, and you know, uh, for people that have never been inside a rotational hard drive, uh, mechanical rotational hard drive, they have some super cool, very strong magnets in these things. You should take them out and play with them. Be careful though, you can oh. lose a finger. I'm serious. Really? Have you ever played with these? No, I know. I, magnets weird me out, dude. I can feel them. I don't. I don't, I don't play with magnets. Like oh, that. then you'd hate these because yeah. 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 It's bad. Bad news, man. Bad juju. <laughs> uh, all right. We'll go to Jeff. Jeff writes, I don't have a solution for him, but let's see if we can get there. He says, I'm having a problem with iMessages appearing out of order on my iPhone 6S running iOS 11.2.1. During active conversation, i.e. sending back and forth without losing long delays, sometimes I receive replies directly above my previously sent message. Messages on my wife's iPhone 6 in the same conversation are in the correct order. My other devices also show the same conversation in the correct order. This issue has persisted through the past few iOS version updates. Any thoughts? And he has gone pretty deep in testing this, so we are going to take his... Um, his report at face value. This is definitely happening. Um, there is a solution that I found on an Apple discussion board. Unfortunately, it did not work for listener Jeff, but uh, it's to go into general or settings, general date and time, and then disable set automatically change the time zone to something else is the advice. Then go in and force quit the messages app, then launch it again. Uh, at this point, it says messages should uh, now be sorted by the time of arrival and then go back into settings, general date and time and set it back to set automatically. Let's hope this works. Uh, like I said, it, Jeff, Jeff didn't do this, but he did something that that sort of uh, came from that. And I think I think he might be in good shape. But uh, 
It's a weird one. If you've ever seen this and, and solved it, please let us know. Feedback at MacGeekCab.com. Um, yeah, I don't know if I got the order on that right, Dave. I think you said feedback at MacGeekCab.com. MacGeekCab feedback at dot com. <laughs> I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> feedback no, you're at MacGeekCab.com. You're going to ha- have to create a new address now. I can't create that address. That's the beauty. That's no. why I said it the way I did was so that uh, I I do it in the wrong yeah. order. And yeah, good. Nor feedback, but um, right. That's right. I'll tell you what I think here. What do you so think? Riddle me this: Are yeah. these messages? So these are, these are an iMessage. They are iMessages. Yes. Uh, could these? Could this be something that the person that's per, whoever's providing the SMS service is doing? Well, that. It, it, it's not SMS. It is iMessage. But uh, okay, that's what it. That's the thing. Is it's it's iMessage. It's not SMS. Okay, because it looked like it was in the messages app that this was happening. Correct, but okay. they're blue bubbles, was, which means it's iMessage, ah, not right, SMS. Right. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so it's definitely Apple's fault, not AT and T's. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's right. It's not. It has nothing to do with the carrier. Yeah. Yeah, because it they could, for all we know, these all of these messages could be going over Wi-Fi. It doesn't matter. There is a weird thing, though, right? Remember, iOS 11 was supposed to sync our iMessages uh, using iCloud, and I think during the beta, we talked about this. Was it during the last episode, or maybe post show after the last one uh, in the chat room at macgeekab.com slash stream, where? I think during the betas of iOS 11 early on, this did happen and then it went away. So I wonder, did Jeff have that iPhone on the beta? And is there, to your concept before, a bit that got flipped that didn't quite go back the way it should have uh, and won't until he either wipes the phone clean or... Apple actually rolls out this feature of, of iOS 11 with iMessage syncing. And then but it's an interesting question because the thing is, who do you trust to tell you the time that something happened? I you know. Or the person that sent it to you. And it sounds like in this case, maybe the source of the time is the cause of the confusion. <laughs> right? Yeah. But how is it that a message that came in, after he sent something is displayed before that one. Ah, I know. It's easy. It's a cache. It got stuck in the cache. <laughs> but the, but the, but that's know. we look, we talked about this in the last episode, John. We agreed to refer to time as a linear construct. We're we're not mm-hmm. like we're like that's that's one of the things we do on this show. So we can't we can't talk well, about we populating can, a cache with we data. Can. Before that data exists, I mean, you and I know that that depends can be done. Time, depends on your time reference. Well, see, that's that's what kind I'm of saying. what I'm trying to say is yeah. whose timestamp do you trust is is the one true timestamp? You know, it's a hard problem. It's a lot harder than people think. It is sure. I mean, although it could just be in the metadata, but yeah. Although uh, you know, mail is a great example, right? Because you can set up mail. In fact, by default, mail shows you date received in mail, which is the date and time that that particular mail client received that message. That's very different from date sent on mail. And it drives me crazy that uh, that. You know, you can you can wind up with a scenario where things are organized by the date that your computer just happened to receive them. So whenever I set up mail on a Mac, I always go to the view menu, go to columns and turn off date received and turn on uh, date sent for those columns. Because, man, I don't you know, I don't want it's like date received is to me is worthless. I don't care what time my computer happened to pull that message down. That's not helpful to me, at least not the way I think about things. I want to know when somebody sent it. 
which can also be spoofed, of course, or in, even unintentionally, if somebody's got their time zone wrong or whatever, that messages can be, appear to have been sent in the future and you know all that stuff. But I don't know. That's my thing, right? So there's your bonus tip for this episode is taking mm-hmm. a look at mail. Yeah. Right? I don't know. Uh, let's see. We have, we have a question from James that I, uh, that I'll start answering here, but you know, John, you had a great point that this would make really good sense for our, um, uh, small business show that I do with Shannon Jean every, every week. So I will, I will cue some of this up, uh, for that episode, but we'll start here. James, uh, writes, he says, life has set me up in such a way that I'm hoping to move into doing my own thing and support consultancy is something I've long considered. I'm a fairly experienced Mac user who knows my way around a lot of common issues. And I'd like to say that I'm red hot on good network setups. What sort of steps did you go through to make sure you're doing everything right and that you can inspire confidence in your clients? I'm aware there will likely be some legal and insurance concerns depending on where you live and what country you're in. Uh, what is it that you do to get yourself started in a consulting business? And, you know, we have a lot of people that listen to this episode to, well, to this episode, but to this show in general who run their own, uh, you know, Mac, iOS, and even windows support consulting businesses. And many of whom did not do that before they started listening. And the show has kind of helped people get there. So, um, you know, I've, um, I've always kind of done most of this stuff. Uh, well, I'd say it's about half and half. I do kind of half of it, what I call grassroots, where I just sort of let it happen. And then half of it, there's, you know, kind of by the numbers things. So in terms of, of by the numbers stuff, the biggest advice that I can give anybody that's going to go out and do some consulting is to figure out how to set your business up so that clients are paying you at the time services are rendered Consultants are the worst at chasing down clients for payments after the fact. And there's a lot of reasons for this. One of them is that you're busy serving the next client and dealing with the next thing because you want to have work to do. The other thing, the other reason is that talking about money can be uncomfortable uh, for people, especially the consultant. Right. But let me but it's not weird for the people that hired you. Right. Right it's if you hire say a plumber right you want to know before that plumber comes out what it's going to cost and you certainly are expecting to pay that person it's not a weird thing but i know when you're in that mode as the consultant it's weird when you get to the end and you say okay yep i just did this thing that i love doing and now i'm going to give you a bill for a not insignificant amount of money for it so Figure out how to do that, you know, and it's easy these days with like Stripe and Square and, and all that good stuff uh, to take credit cards. But you can also take checks. Obviously, those are easy and cash. Always take cash. If someone offers it, there's no reason not to take cash in your business. It's a beautiful thing. But, um, you know, be upfront about pricing, be upfront about how you charge. That will make the that discussion at the end of an appointment much simpler because you've already, the, the, the expectation is already set. If you say, Hey, uh, you know, I charge whatever 150 bucks an hour and I have a one hour minimum, but I don't charge for travel time when I come out to see you. Okay, great. Now everybody's on the same page. If they say, great, I'd like to have you come out. Great. Okay. I'll see you Tuesday, whatever you're good to go. And then you get to the end you just stay consistent with that. Um, so that that's kind of the, the, you know, the, the, by the numbers stuff is, is about the numbers that I wouldn't go nuts about organizing a business entity right away. We'll talk more about that on the, on the small business show, but get your business started. Just go out and do it. Um, you know, obviously you got to be careful. Uh, and there are some liabilities, but you can drive yourself crazy mitigating every single risk. Just get out there and start doing stuff. Um, certifications. And when now switching to the grassroots side of things, uh, I find them valuable from a marketing standpoint. Now that doesn't mean that the classes that go along with certifications aren't valuable. Uh, you're, you're definitely going to want to keep learning 
new things. And if in the process of learning new things, you wind up getting a certification, great. But I wouldn't spend all of your available time chasing just certifications. They are one way of marketing yourself, but they're not the only way. Um, it, you know, really what's going to market you is you going out, doing good work and either being able to point people to those clients and say, look, they're happy or even better when those clients, because they're happy, refer you to other people. So, uh, you know, don't drive yourself nuts with certifications. I, I feel like your work is, is the thing that matters the most. So keep learning, keep gaining new skills, but don't drive yourself crazy with those. Uh, just market yourself and market yourself. Uh, you're out there on your own. Yes. Someday you might grow your business and have some other people working for you. That's great, but be yourself. Um, you know, I always called myself Dave, the nerd. That's because clients called me that. Uh, it was actually one client, Mark majors at majors jewelers in Austin. I walked in one day and he's like, Dave, the nerd. And I thought, Oh, perfect. That's great. And then I changed the name of my business. Dave, the nerd. That's what I did. Uh, be yourself, you know, that kind of, that Dave, the nerd thing works for me. So, but you gotta, you gotta have whatever it is that works for you. Unless you're a jerk, then market yourself differently. Don't market yourself as yourself. Right, John? You don't want to, you know, nobody hires. Hi there. I'm a jerk. Hi, nobody hires the, the, yeah, the plumber that business. says, right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll show up and I'll be a jerk to you. I'll shame you. Although, you know, when we go to the dentist, I feel like that's exactly what they want to do. They want to shame me every time I walk in there. I hate going to the dentist because of that. I don't want to be shamed. Stupid. I'm, I'm paying you to help me with a thing. Oh, no. We just have a conversation. When's the last time you flossed? It's like, yeah, you know. Yeah. They That's pretty much the end of it because I'm paying them. Mm hmm. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You don't want to be Thanks that. Thanks for the guy. reminder. Thanks for the passive aggressive kind of right. step reminder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, in the end, I, I think that the, the biggest advice I can give is be committed to your customers like success and well-being because and, and communicate that in every way you can. In fact, epitomize that you never want to walk in and inherit the customer's problem as your fault because that you're screwed when you do that. Just you want to go in and make it clear that you're there to help them with their problems. And it's you and the customer versus the problem. Um, you know, if you, if you know your stuff, great. And if you don't, don't be afraid to tell the customer, Hey, I'm in over my head. Um, you know what I want to do is I want to pause the clock right here. I want to go and do some research on my own time. Although, and, and then come back that that's fine. There are times though. And as you do more and more consulting, you will learn when these times are because more often than not that research that, you might be tempted to do off the clock is absolutely valid to be doing on the clock. You're the one that's the expert, you know how to do the research, you know how to apply the knowledge that you gain from the research to their specific problem. And absolutely that can be a very valuable time for the customer and therefore a valuable time for you. So we'll talk more about this on the small business show. I'll, I'll circle back once that episode kind of happens and, and I'll point everybody to it, but always like to kind of rekindle this conversation once every few months, because I know there's a lot of you out there that are doing it. And um, I think, I think most people that listen to this show do consulting in some capacity, whether it's paid or for free for friends and family and all of that. We all help out yes. friends and family. <laughs> yeah. It's just, I mean, it's what we do. It's, you know, it's how it works. Right. Um, yeah. 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 I guess the thing it, to me uh, to focus on, or just a question yeah. in my mind yeah. or something to address would be, how do you get your name out there? Um, when I did this sort of thing, the thing is I worked at one point at a computer store. So that's kind of how, how I glommed onto clients was, well, they knew yeah. what I did there and uh, through school, um, you know, taking computer courses and stuff, you figure out who needs that sort of thing. Uh, Co-op programs helped out to make contacts as well, or at least, you know, get a foot in the door. Yeah. Um, well, you know, there's all these, uh, I mean, you know, it could be as simple as Yelp, maybe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think I'm just trying to think in this day and age, if I was launching a consulting business, where would I start a local? I Yeah, that's, you no, know, you're right. I've talked to a lot of folks who 
uh, you know, who are very actively marketing themselves these days. And, and I am, I am not actively marketing myself. I've, I've mentioned my Dave, the nerd uh, consulting business here on this show. And the fact that, yes, I am open to new clients. I'm, I'm very carefully not going out and doing what I would normally do, which is, you know, market and blanket and all of that, because I need to be careful with, with my time. But I'm very happy to take on uh, you folks that listen here. The pacing of that has been great. So if you're interested, DaveTheNerd.com or, you know, you guys know how to contact me. Feel free to contact me anyway. Uh, but if I were going to go to the next level, yeah. Um, Yelp is one place. Yelp is sort of a reactionary thing where you're sort of managing the customer reviews. But you, you absolutely need to be engaged there. Um, Google. Uh, especially Google local ads and those sorts of things. That's where a lot of folks that I talk to are getting a lot of success. Uh, if you have a local, depending on the size of your town, you may have like a weekly paper or even a weekly email newsletter that comes out. You'll know your town, you know, better than I could from here, but there's going to be something, some way that people get their news about your town, like about your town or their town, right? What's happening? Now, have you tried? I got something. It was probably six months ago, a postcard saying, hey, you want to join this thing called Nextdoor? And it's like, yeah, sure. Yeah. And it was, and it's a, basically it gets addressed to you by people that are near you streetwise. Yes. Saying that you're a neighbor. And I'm like, well, yeah, I, though I don't know this person. I'm in this neighborhood. So, and it's a community-based you know, kind of localized message system. And they have had, I've seen on mine saying, Hey, anybody know how to, you know, fix my computer. Right. <laughs> well, and that's it, right? It, next door is a great one. Facebook too. It, you know, a lot of people have neighborhood Facebook groups or whatever. And it's oh, okay. like, it, you know, it's like anything. If you're there and being helpful, then when someone's looking for a recommendation, it doesn't seem too spammy for you to, to jump in on that. But if your town has that, you know, I know it sounds strange to some of you, but a lot of towns, you know, especially those in kind of the, you know, five to 20,000 person range have that weekly paper that comes out or even a daily paper. Right. And a lot of people read it, especially a lot of people that might be exactly the type of people that would hire someone like you. So putting an ad in one of those papers can make a huge difference to your business, uh, even still. But but I would I would definitely, you know, augment that. And you might find that that, you know, the Google ads are are even better for that because you can do the hyper targeted and all of that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, in this day and age, you probably probably going door to door asking people if they need their computer fixed is probably not the best uh strategy no it's not the best take use of your time too much time yeah warren in the chat room <laughs> is saying uh he says next next door was fun for about a week that's been my experience with it here <laughs> but i know people in it just depends on how engaged your particular community gets with it but at the same almost in the same breath warren says i get a lot of work from my neighborhood facebook page it's you know people are going to find a way of connecting with those people around them. It, it's been happening for years. It's just, we have different tools now find that thing for your area, which you probably already know about because a, you're a geek and B hopefully you're at least semi engaged and aware of what's happening in your, in your community. And if you're not, then, then fix that. Right. And now be a part of that and, you know, start offering help. If somebody says, Hey, my iPhone has a problem or, you know, whatever you just like, Oh yeah, go check this out. Or I need a new router. Okay, great. You should buy this one or whatever. And then people just get to know you as that expert. And then when it comes time to hang your shingle in a, in a more official sense, you can say, Oh yeah. Yep. If, uh, if you need help with that, here I am. People say, Oh, right. That guy or that woman. Great. Awesome. Sweet. So there you go. So That's what um, I got. Yes, John. Two things. One, um, plugging my iPhone into my, uh, MacBook pro. It yeah. says charger watch 10. Charger voltage, five millivolt, five thousand millivolts. Charger amperage, two point twenty one hundred milliamps. So basically, okay. uh, iStat menus reports the. Uh, you, keep, you keep voltage. saying iStat menus, but what you mean is iMazing. Is that right? iMazing Mini. Sorry. Okay, great, no problem. <laughs> I, it, I I knew what you meant. I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Yep. Yeah, so, and and that's using that for other things. Yeah, that's doing it over Wi-Fi, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. 
okay. well, in this case, it's plugged in, but I... Well, no, in this case, in order for it to be charging, I have to... I don't know. I suspect okay. the answer is yes. I mean, it's plugged into the... It's advertising the capabilities of the uh, computer itself. Oh, I, I see. It. So it's it, you have it plugged into the computer, not plugged into, say, a, a wall charger right. or something. But I'm, I'm certain I've done this before where okay. it's plugged into an external charger. Okay. I recorded that. So All right. Okay. It'll tell you. I'll dig in. All right, cool. And the other thing is, Dave, I don't know if I can quite hear you. Are you having a problem hearing me, John? <laughs> well, you know, I got these headphones here. <laughs> And uh, the, I, I don't know if you're, you're wearing earphones. Or, I, uh, I am. I'm wearing, well, I'm wearing these crazy things, these JH Audio Laylas, which are awesome, but totally overkill. I, I, I say they're overkill. I mean, it allows me to mix the show in a beautiful way. But I think where you're going with this is bringing us into our next subject here, John, which is all about headphones uh, and Bluetooth. And at least that's where we're going to start. Is that what you meant to do, John? <sighs> Kind of, because I, I don't know if I have much personally to contribute here. Okay. All my headphones and earphones seems to be working at... Well, that's good. That's good. But Richard had a question on Facebook. Richard asked, he says, I'm looking for a solution where I can connect two Bluetooth headphones to an Apple TV simultaneously, please. And, uh, and this is an interesting thing, right? Because Bluetooth is meant one at a time. And that's how the tech works. But I did a little digging and there are little devices that you can buy. Uh, I found two of them. In fact, I found one for 40 bucks on Amazon that will take a signal from either a, 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 a headphone jack or the toss link, which is that optical light pipe with the really thin cable that uh, that you usually get out of your TV and you take that, you plug that into one of these, and then this will allow you to pair two stereo sets of headphones. So, which is interesting, right? Because if you've got- So it's a Bluetooth splitter? Let's call it that. Although, it, is, yeah. Is it creating two Bluetooth yes. audio streams out of one? Okay. Out of, well, like not out different- of one Bluetooth stream. It's taking one wired or- stream and creating okay. two Bluetooth. But yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so they have different, so the two pairings occur. You pair with one or pair with the other. Okay. Correct. And they can obviously uh, happen simultaneously. So, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. And so that, that one's from Tautronics for 40 bucks. And I'll, I'll link to the, uh, uh, to the um, Facebook post too. Now, is so there a, take a look. It's like, I know you spoke before about latency and Bluetooth audio. Would, would there be, or, or no, I guess if it does the job properly, it should be. What? No, that's splitting a good... the signal. What do you? What do you? I yes. Okay. So yes. Would, would do it. Would splitting a Bluetooth? Uh, would would generating two of the streams? Uh, is the thing that's doing this going to get overpowered, or would you assume that it would be able to you know keep up? Well, that's a good question, and it depends as much on the device as it does on the earphones to which it pairs um, it uses it will use a technology called aptx or aptx as the industry calls it which is a very high quality low latency bluetooth codec right so it it has to take the audio it has to you know compress it send it across the bluetooth stream and then your headphones need to take that signal and decompress it and play the audio for you and that process is going to introduce a lag into the stream. Now, the question is, can it, can the lag be reduced such that to our brains, it is not perceptible. And Aptex is pretty good at that. So long as your earphones support it. And so long as both earphones can support it similarly enough that everybody's happy simultaneously. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I, it, I, it, it should be able to do it. Um, there you go. It's 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 built to do that. Um, you've just got to make sure you have earphones that support what they call Aptex or even a better Aptex low latency, which is a, a protocol, a subset of the Aptex protocol. So, yeah. Good to know. Yeah. That's yeah. what I wanted to know. That's what we're here for, man. It's 
good. Leave the technology on me. Yeah. The the sad part is that Apple's devices, i.e. the iPhone and the Mac, don't support aptics. They support an AAC type of thing over Bluetooth, but they don't support aptics, which is sort of sad. But, you know, that's um, that's how Apple goes. And then there's another one from me audio m e e audio that uh does the same thing it's almost twice the price at 60 bucks on amazon both of them have uh, i think about four stars worth of reviews there's some people that are just utterly utterly displeased with these products and then most people are like yeah it works exactly like it's supposed to so you know there you go i don't know if there's a i don't know that with a product like this there's so many there's so many things that could go wrong, right? You know, if you've got interference in your house or you've got crappy Bluetooth earphones that can't keep up, like there's, there's a lot. I think both of these things would work just fine given the right things. So there you go. On, uh, on the Bluetooth audio subject though, John listener, Johnny had, uh, had a question. Actually, he had a solution. He says, recently, I had a problem with my inexpensive Bluetooth earbuds that I thought I would share. I have some Tautronics Bluetooth earbuds that I use with my iPhone and iPad. I noticed, though, that when I was at home, there was a lot of interference with them when I tried to use them with my iPhone. So I thought there must be something at home that was interfering with the earbuds, maybe microwaves or cordless phones. Recently, when I looked into the issue a little more, it was something that was interfering, but it was not actually my iPad. I had paired the earbuds to the iPad so I could watch an epic 1950s sci-fi on YouTube and not annoy my wife too much. It seems that the interaction of the earbuds with the iPad and the iPhone differ. When I power the earbuds on, they automatically pair with my iPad. On the iPhone, I have to go into the Bluetooth setting and select them to pair them. I experimented with unpairing and pairing the earbuds with the iPad and iPhone. It doesn't seem to matter if I pair them to the phone first. They will always pair to the iPad when I power them on. Also, if I pair the earbuds to the iPhone, I cannot pair them with the iPad, but not the reverse. Once I recognized that the earbuds were paired to both and then removed them from the iPad, the interference issue was solved. So it wasn't so much interference. Uh, I guess it's a, I mean, I guess interference is sort of a good blanket term. But it was just that the the earbuds were trying to serve two masters, and that's never gonna that's never gonna fly. So that's pretty interesting. Thanks, Johnny. I, I don't know that I would have. It would have taken me a while to catch that one too. I think is a fair way to say that. Yeah, pretty interesting, huh, John? I want nothing to do with it. You you don't use Bluetooth earphones at all, John? No. Huh. All right. Nope. The only Bluetooth I have is uh, what enables um, the Mac and my iOS things to kind of do smart things with each oh, other. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's right. You don't have a Bluetooth in the car. Huh. No. No, it's old. Yeah. Well, you could. I mean, you could do one of those aftermarket Bluetooth things in the car. Those those actually work really well. The things you just put on the visor. I mean, I could powered. replace the cassette player with maybe a CD player. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, (laughs) listener Scott, while we're on the subject of earphones, asks, he says, I have to direct this question to you because you are an earphone dude, Dave. He says, knowing that in-ear monitors or any headphone is a totally subjective thing, which have you tried and like? He says, I've been using a pair of uh, Boses that are no longer available. Uh, He says, my understanding is that, uh, where are we here? He says, uh, trying to get to his question where uh i don't know what's he's uh, basically his question is what are the best earphones for here still hearing things around you because he says uh it's really important to me because the other in-ear monitors that i've tried tend to be so isolating that when talking I feel like I'm yelling in my ears. That's why I stopped using on-ear and over-the-ear headphones over the years. And he points to the Westone. They're a universal fit. Uh, They call them the AM Pro 30. uh, And uh, they've got an, an ambient port in them to let sound in. Here's the thing. Um, 
those ambient ports are great for what they are engineered to do, which is allow on stage musicians, singers, you know, performers, whatever, to hear some of what's going on around them on a very loud stage. Normally earphones, like when you put earbuds in and they totally seal your ears, they block 25, maybe even 30 decibels worth of sound, which is a lot because of that. And it can be very isolating on stage, especially if you don't have everything that you want in those in-ear mixes. So all these companies started building these, these in-ear things with ambient ports in them to let some sound in. And that reduces their overall uh, blockage from 30 dB down to about 12 dB. But 12 dB is still a lot, especially when you're talking about conversation. So I don't think using, if you want to hear sound around you, I don't think using one of these fully sealing with an ambient port thing is going to serve what you want. I use that. That's exactly what I use on stage. And if someone's talking to me, I have to take one out to hear them. It, it's not enough, but it is enough to hear like symbols and things around me without having to mic them up. So I, I think for sort of general day use, the ambient port earphones are not what you want to use, Scott. Um, there are some options, though. And one would be to use something like Apple's AirPods, right? which don't seal in your ear. They sit in your ear, but they don't seal. And frankly, for what you're talking about, where you want to hear either your music or a podcast or whatever in your ear, but still hear what's going on around you, the AirPods are probably the easiest uh, ones to use where you're still going to get good sound quality and that sort of thing. They don't seal. They sound really good. And yet you can still have a conversation and, and hear what's going on around you. If you want something that seals that lets sound in though, I think you're going to have to do that with microphones. And we've reviewed a lot of different headphones over the years that have an option for letting sound in the JBL Everest's that we just talked about recently have a little button that you can push and it lets uh, ambient sound in the pioneer rays that John, you and I were talking about pre-show have an option to let they've got a microphone in them because they've got a microphone for your speakerphone or your headset thing. And, and they use that and now let sound in while you're still hearing your music. So uh, that is an option, but I got to be honest with you. It's weird hearing someone's voice coming through a microphone. That's not exactly where your ears are. Um, and it's amplified in an odd way. And the EQ is weird because it's a tiny little microphone. It sounds like they're talking to you on the phone because they kind of are. So uh, I think AirPods are probably going to be the most natural thing. If you want that experience of ambient sound coming in. That's my, uh, that's my thought on that, John. Hopefully that's helpful. What are your thoughts on, oh, I had these years ago and they were okay. Yeah. Um, Bose quiet comfort supposedly acoustic noise canceling headphones. Yeah. When no. I did use them on a plane, um, when I had a pair, it kind of seemed to accomplish its purpose. The seal was good, um, but it had a, a noise monitoring thing where, you know, if the, uh, whoever was, you know, trying to deal with you wanted to talk to you, you could hear them. And it just kind of seemed to be smart enough, whatever, DSP or other magic device they had in there, it, uh, it, it seemed to balance it pretty good with what I wanted to listen to. Yeah. So. Um, I, again, like th you're right, it, especially on an airplane where you've got so much ambient noise, you know, I think, I mean, the plane's just creating the, the engines of the plane and the, the fans on the plane. But I think create. it's easy noise to filter out, isn't it? It is. Kind of, yeah. Cause it's, it's a, it's pretty constant. It's consistent. Right. <laughs> yep. Um, and, and that's what you're going to get with in, in different ways with like the Pioneer Rays or the, the JBL stuff and the Bose Quiet Comfort. Those active noise canceling headphones uh, can certainly do it. it it's weird. You, you're still very detached from people around you, I, I think. And of course, this is all very subjective. But um, but yeah, I, I mean, I've used those Bose Quiet Comforts. I've never owned a pair, but I've been on some flights where, you know, you get the upgrade to first class or whatever and they – would hand this is before they had screens in the seats and they would come around and like mm -hmm. hand out like a tablet with the quiet comfort headphones. And it's like, Oh sweet. You can watch a movie. And yeah, 
I mean, you can hear what's going on around you. It's fine. You can tune it and set it at different levels. And yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, again, I found it weird. Like if I was going to hold a conversation with the flight attendant in those scenarios, I invariably yeah. found myself taking the headphones off and just talking to this other human being. Um, but in terms of hearing announcements and things like that, yeah, those th- that worked really well. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I don't know. Uh, speaking of announcements. Speaking. Uh, Everett actually has a question that sort of went in the same, same concept, but went in a different direction. He says, uh, I remember ages back, and I believe it may have been as far back as the 12-inch PowerBook era, one of you <laughs> mentioning software or a device that you could use to route room audio in to your headphones so you didn't have to keep taking them off when you were talking to someone. I'm praying it's a device because my wife leads worship at my church with a wireless in-ears. She is new to these things, so it takes her a while to put them on and needs to be able to talk to people uh, up until she walks on stage and starts the set. So, no, um, I I don't think this is going to do what you want for all the reasons we just talked about. Um, that said, it was a piece of software that we talked about. I remember this conversation. That software has evolved over the years as this show has, but the name is still pretty much the same and it's Audio Hijack. Uh, you can use huh. Audio Hijack, yeah, to route audio and do anything with it. And, and so, yeah, I, I would, um, and I would do this on airplanes sometimes if I was going to watch a movie and I could just kick in audio hijack when I wanted, and it would just take the microphone on my Mac and I would just have a very simple audio hijack layout where it, it takes a mic in and you, you, with audio hijack now, it's really, really easy. In fact, we were talking about it earlier. You just move things around in blocks. So I would take a block that was my internal microphone on my Mac and a block that is my, uh, you know, built in output or whatever they call the sound output device that you plug your headphones into and you connect them up to each other. And now anything that goes into the microphone goes to your ears and there'll be a little delay and stuff. But again, it's the same kind of thing. If you want to hear the, uh, the announcements and stuff, you certainly can do that. So that's, that's how I, that, that's what we, that's what I used to do back in those days. Cause it was, you know, fun. I don't know. It's crazy. Any thoughts on that, John? The thought is Dave, you know, sometimes just take your headphones or earphones off and talk to people for a change. I get whatever it's saying though. <laughs> uh, no, like putting in in-ears, um, especially universal no, fit ones. It can, yeah, it can be a, a weird thing where like if I'm walking on stage, I've gotten pretty used to it, but I've been doing this for, you know, 15 years or whatever now, maybe actually more than that. Wow. Uh, it, it's a weird thing kind of screwing these things into your ears and getting it just right and being comfortable with it. Oh yeah. And I all know that. I, so, okay. yeah. But, um, yeah. or, you know, uh, learn lip reading. It's never too late. Learn a new skill. Hey, it's actually maybe sign language too, you know? Well, Expand your then you, well, then you need everybody about around you to, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll put well, a lip reading the beginner's guide to lip reading at, from lip reading.org. I'll put that in the show notes for us. Really? Yeah. Sure. That Why exists. It does. it does. It does. Yeah. No, it's already in the show notes. It's good to go. Uh, and hey, have, if you want to be a, a spy ahead. on the side. Yeah. Helpful. Can't hurt. No, that's right. All right, but my I'm son got a lockpick set for uh, for Christmas. That's actually been really fun to play Is with. Is that legal? Well, uh, maybe he's starting a business, becoming becoming a locksmith. Okay, all right. So legal to own. Correct. Yes. Okay. It's just a tool okay. with great power, John. Right. Right. And with hey, great power. I do want to thank our premium subscribers, without whom we really um, couldn't do this. We couldn't do it without any of you. To be perfectly yeah, but, honest. But, uh, but I do want to take a moment to thank our premium subscribers. At the monthly $10 level, we have Ken L. Clive S. Everett, who we just heard from. Ev the nerd, as we call him. David G. Nick S. David M. And Micah P. Everybody's at the $10 a month level, except Micah P., who chooses to be at the $15 a month level. Uh, thank you, all of you. You rock. And at the biannual 25 bucks every six months level, we have Barry P, Peter P, no relation, Warren R, 
Joe W. Antonio B., Joe M., Brett H., and Terrence N. Thank you to all of you, and a, a really a special thanks to those of you who had to go through the the pain of of migrating from our old credit card system to our new one. Terrence, I know I watched it happen with you as as the emails were coming in, as, as it was telling you your subscription failed to process, and then you went and came around and did it. Thank you for everybody that's gone through all of that. Um, really, we, like we say thanks every week, obviously. Uh, I don't want it ever to sound perfunctory. It, we really mean it. So thank you a ton. Uh, John, I think we have time left for at least a couple of cool stuffs found and, uh, and maybe a couple of tips. Ready? Ready, Freddy. Okay. <laughs> uh, starting off with brother Jay, who brings us not one, not two, but three cool stuffs found. He says, uh, in a recent show, you were talking about ping bar, which I've never tried which I've never tried, but what I use is a tool called peak hour. Its capabilities are more than simply monitoring ping time, but it does that as well. One requirement, which makes it unique is for routers with which it communicates to have the proper UPnP specification implemented. He says, unfortunately I've realized that Eero does not have the proper UPnP inf- implementation. He says, and I've contacted them about this, uh, but peak hour is the CSF for that one. So thank you. Uh, He says, uh, secondly, you mentioned deliveries. He says, I use parcel, which I believe is at parcelapp.net. And uh, he says, once upon a time, I used deliveries, but I found that parcel supports more couriers. I conducted some intense comparisons amongst parcel and deliveries and parcels push notifications, at least from my tests were much more timely the one glaring bug Ivan fails to fix is the 50 something character limit in the description field. I am a verbose but concise brother, and sometimes my package descriptions exceed 50 characters. The only way this can be circumvented is to use the Braille screen input on iOS. It allows for unlimited characters to be entered, but not backspaced. Strange bug. That's a strange workaround. Hmm. I love this stuff. I love it when, you know, there's this aside thing. You can fit more characters in if you use the Braille input. Never would have thought about that, man. Finally, he says, to delay program launches at startup, uh, I use Startupizer. Uh, He says, it has worked well for the past approximately two years. I've used it. Another one of my favorites to manipulate when programs launch is Lingon X, uh, which we love here. He says, it's very nice because in addition to programs, one can launch and manipulate launch agents. So there you go. Cool. Thank you for those, Brother Jay. That's uh, that's a lot of stuff right there, John. We love it. It's good. John, there are, it takes a lot this time of year when the temperature is like 20 and later this week is going to be six. Are you kidding me? Yeah. It takes a lot for me to think about the beach in a visceral way. You know, like beat the summer at the beach. I can think about being cold at the beach, but, you know, uh, that happened this weekend. We were uh, playing with, you know, some stuff that that showed up. And one of the things that showed up was this new JBL boom box. So JBL has long been uh, really my favorite vendor of portable speakers. They, they just, they know what they're doing. They do fun things with them. They have that pulse speaker that has lights. They've got the flip speakers. They all sound really good. And the boom box sort of takes that to a whole new level. This thing is a monster. It really, it is, it, it can, be, I don't want to say it's built to sit up on your shoulder like the old 80s style boom boxes, <laughs> but, but you certainly can do that with it. And it is that big. It's a monstrous thing, but it kind of has that look of the flip. It's just a huge flip and it's got a handle on it. The thing is massive. It's got indoor and outdoor sound modes. And when you put it in that outdoor mode, what that does is it, adds a whole level of roundness to the to the low end to the base of it which is what you'd want outside at the beach and we were messing around with it and for some reason my my son's hockey team they uh this all came up because he's like hi do you have any speakers that i could use like in the locker room we want something loud i'm like oh i have the speaker for you and and then we started talking about what songs he 
he plays and they play all this yacht rock stuff like uh, dancing in the moonlight and and uh, escape and all. The, it's really, uh-huh. it's like the hits of the 70s. It's interesting. You know, a bunch of bunch of kids that that's what they like to play in the locker room. So it's fine. Uh, but um, this thing really like it's what you'd want at the beach. It's pretty awesome. It's not cheap. It's 450 bucks. I mean, this is a serious piece of hardware. But uh, it's got a 20,000 milliamp hour battery in it, a couple of USB ports on it that you can charge your phone, whatever you want with. And it's totally waterproof. Uh, so perfect for the beach. Yeah. So, yeah. My first thought, where's the skin that has the uh, old style, <laughs> you know, mid-range <laughs> speakers? Yeah. I mean, that was the whole thing about having the boom boxes, not only putting it up on your shoulder there to blast. Right your tunes to your neighbors, but you saw these very prominent, you know, uh, powerful looking, uh, one would assume speakers. Right. Somebody's going to make skins for this. I can tell. <laughs> it's a pretty cool thing. I got to be honest with you. It sounds How much does so it good. Um, it's not light. I, I mean, it's, you know, it's a big monster thing. So I'm looking at the features here. It, it should be in there. somewhere. It should be in there somewhere. <clears throat> I don't specifications, see. but yeah. Yeah, I don't see it right on the website. Uh, 5.25 kilograms. Uh, I, I, my math is awful on that. But, but thankfully, Sear, or, uh, Spotlight does 11 it for pounds. Me. So 12 pounds. Yeah, or well, 11 and a half. Yeah, split the difference. Yeah. So, oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool, though. It's pretty cool, man. So I wanted to just wanted to. I, it, it, like I said, it takes a lot for me to think about the beach, but as soon as we started playing this thing, it was like, oh yeah, this would rock at the beach. I mean, you'd have to be there with, with a group of people that all wanted to hear the same music you had because everybody's going to hear it. But that's sort of the point, I guess. All right. Where are we here on time? You know, I think, I, 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 I think we need to, um, I think we need to call this one, John. It's just, you know, that's how it works. Down I think so. Slowly. Uh, yeah, as slowly as, as you like. We told you how to email us unless you're a premium customer. We thanked all our premium customers, but we didn't tell you how to become one. MacGeekGeb.com slash premium. That's how you learn to become one. Uh, if you are one, you can email us at premium at MacGeekGeb.com. We prioritize the stuff that comes in there. You help us. We help you. We answer everything. We really do try to answer everything that comes in. Sometimes things get crazy, and the stuff that comes into the other box is answered a little more slowly. Premium stuff we always stay on top of. And if you want to get on the rap rod... Yes. 206-666. No, 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 no. I'm nope. sorry. I'm not looking at the note. <laughs> you know, it's good, though. Delete, we, delete, we delete. We say this every week, and <laughs> and it, it, like, burns itself into our brains, which is why... Well, after a decade, yeah. it did. Yeah. So, um... Pick up the rap rod, which is a telephone, which is a uh, audio slash digital communication device. Last I checked. But anyways, if it has numbers on it, the numbers you want to put in and letters are 224-888-GEEK, which is... 4335. That's how we do it. You can also find us on Facebook. Go to MacGeekUp.com slash Facebook. That's the best way to get over to our group there where we're all chit-chatting and talking about stuff. It's pretty freaking Awesome. I want to make sure we thank Cashfly at C A C A G F L Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Of course, our podcast marketplace with sponsors like Smile, TextExpander.com slash podcast is their link. Barebones with BB Edit 12, which really is rocking. I'm loving it. Other World Computing, I think we even mention them during the show because they always have stuff that helps us stuff. with the kinds of things that we talk about. We got the stuff. Yeah, man. <sighs> well, folks, this is it. This is the end of Mac Geek Gab for 2017 in terms of recording the episodes. I know. It's pretty crazy. Now uh, what? Well, we just go to 2018. It's really not. I mean, it's, you know, we'll have this um, moment of fanfare between now and when we do the next show. But really, it, you know, we've already discussed time is just this linear thing and it just sort of happens and whether we choose to celebrate no, every not. moment. John, I told you, I told you, I agree with you. We can't, we can't turn this show into the crazy. So we have to, we have to, we have to have to maintain some semblance of order 
I think. We'll make that decision next year. <laughs> but if you do choose to celebrate this moment of fanfare that will happen uh, when we change from 2017 to 2018, even though it's all just happening right away, I'm going to be celebrating it sitting behind a drum set uh, doing yet another midnight performance of uh, the Rocky Horror Show uh, in Portsmouth, which is, should be fun. We did one last night, Christmas yeah. night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty crazy. But uh, but however you choose to celebrate it, there really is one sort of umbrella principle that I not only implore you to follow, but but I, I really want you to follow because I care about you. And I care about... Uh, like you folks, you provide us the energy to do this show and, and it in, in a lot of different ways. And it really matters to me. And I care about you because we've had this exchange of energy. I know we're not supposed to get all woo woo time linear. No question. Energy exchange. Sure. We can get woo woo. Here's the deal. Don't get caught and happy new year. Happy new year. John. Happy new year. <laughs> <laughs>